What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. I am so glad to be back here on your screens for the start of Shark Bites season five. We've got so much cool content coming your way this season. I can't wait to get stuck in. So after a creature feature video we did on oceanic white tip sharks back in season four of Shark Bites, I asked you guys if you wanted to see a video on the USS Indianapolis and a lot of you did. So to kick off the start of season five, I have decided to do just that. It's a pretty dark and very real story that has been told a bunch of times down the years and you'll find loads of videos on YouTube about it. Generally though, most of the videos you will find on YouTube about the USS Indianapolis will tend to talk about what happened via the stories of the survivors. Although I haven't been able to find any videos that go into some real detail about the sharks and why they might have attacked the sailors who ended up in the water. So here's where I come in. Today you're going to get a video from a shark scientist explaining to you exactly what went down on those fateful days back in July 1945 and more importantly, why? I'm gonna give you a brief rundown on what happened and then we're gonna take a look at some of the shark species that might have been responsible and why they might have attacked. Now, just a heads up here, everyone, I am no historian, so if there are a few minor details I get wrong, I hold my hands up and apologize. I have done a decent amount of reading for the video though, so I'd hope that I would get most of it correct. What I am, however, is a shark scientist, so hopefully I can give you some pretty in-depth insight into the sharks and their behavior. Obviously, I can only base the information off the eyewitness accounts from the sailors who survived the incident, as of course, I wasn't there. But those eyewitness accounts can give us a pretty decent idea on what we're went down and then I can expand on them with my thoughts on the sharks. Before we start though, if you like this kind of video, then please do give it a like. It's that thumbs up button below this video right now. It makes a massive difference to the channel. And if you wanna keep seeing more content like this on the channel, especially longer content, then please, please do give the video a like. Okay, right, let's take a look at the USS Indianapolis incident from the viewpoint of a shark scientist. So for those of you that don't know, the USS Indianapolis was a US naval warship that was cruising around the ocean during the Second World War. In July 1945, it was assigned a super secret mission of which barely anyone knew anything about. But it was ordered to deliver some cargo to a little island known as Tinian in the Mariana Island group in the Western Pacific Ocean, which sits not too far from Japan. What the captain and crew were unaware of at the time is that they'd actually delivered the uranium needed for the atomic bomb Little Boy, which was eventually dropped on Hiroshima alongside the atom bomb Fat Man, which was dropped on Nagasaki, and that ultimately ended the Second World War. So after delivering this top secret cargo, the USS Indianapolis briefly headed to Guam, where a few of the sailors disembarked and were replaced by other sailors. Christ, can you imagine being one of those sailors that got off at Guam? That's some real final destination shit right there. Anyway, after Guam, the ship was then ordered back to the Philippines with the island of Leyte being its intended destination. Although sadly, the ship would never make it to Leyte. On the evening of July the 29th, 1945, a Japanese submarine, the I-58, surfaced to check for activity on the seas. Unfortunately for the crew of the USS Indianapolis, a brief glint of moonlight from behind the clouds silhouetted their ship on the horizon, of which was spotted by Captain Hashimoto, who ordered the sub down and waited to attack. Shortly after midnight on July the 30th, two torpedoes slammed into the side of the USS Indianapolis, igniting it into a fiery inferno and spilling oil into the surrounding water. The catastrophic damage to the ship meant that it stood no chance and the vessel went down in about 12 minutes. Of the 1196 men that were on board, it's thought that about 900 of them ended up in the water. A few distress signals were sent before the ship went down, but those receiving those distress signals thought they were trapped by the Japanese to try and lure ships into the surrounding area and sink them. So as such, those distress signals were ignored. The 900 men that ended up in the water were to spend the next four days battling their own minds, the elements, and sharks. So we're coming up to the pretty gruesome bit now, which is obviously where the sharks come in. But first, I think it'd be worth having a look at what kind of shark species might have been in that water. <laughs> So the Philippines and the Philippine Sea are a massively biodiverse area for shark species. There's about 200 different shark species that have been documented in these waters, but we can probably cut out a lot of them from the get-go. The Indianapolis sank about 280 miles from the nearest land, so we're pretty much talking about open ocean here. Again, though, there are lots of different shark species that are roaming around the open ocean of the Philippines and the Western Pacific Ocean. We've got blue sharks, silky sharks, mako sharks, oceanic white tips, hammerheads, and probably tiger sharks. Now, a lot of those sharks that I've just mentioned there are pretty unlikely to attack humans, but there are some on that list that definitely have attacked 
and killed humans in the past. For me, blues, makos, silkies, and hammerheads would probably be a little bit too skittish in a situation like this. So it leaves two main culprits, the tiger shark and the oceanic whitetip. We can also cross-reference this with some of the stories from the survivors, one of which was the captain, Charles McVeigh. And here he writes, the kids who were in rafts by themselves on this one raft were scared to death of this shark because he kept swimming underneath the raft. You could see his big dorsal fin and it was white almost as white as a sheet of paper. So that to me is clear as day, you've got oceanic white tips involved. As for tiger sharks, that one is a little bit more unclear, but based on some of the survivor recounts of those shark attacks, some of these men are losing limbs after a single bite from a shark. There aren't many sharks that can cleanly take off a limb with one bite, but the incredibly serrated teeth of a tiger shark can most definitely do that. I might have thought some of the sailors could have recognized the tiger stripes on tiger sharks, or at least described them in some of their recounts, but if the sharks were attacking at night or most of their bodies were underwater, stripes might have been hard to see. So we got two potential shark species there, the oceanic white tip shark, which is an open ocean predatory shark, and then the tiger shark, which is a scavenger shark that'll pretty much eat anything. When we think of open ocean sharks as well, like the oceanic white tip, these are shark species that live out in the mass expanse of nothingness where food is really, really scarce. So they're opportunistic, which means when they come across a potential food source, they're definitely going to investigate it and check it out and it means they have to eat what they can when they can to survive. There are loads of accounts of oceanic white tips following ships down the years in the hope they might get some food scraps or discards that were thrown overboard. They even got given the name sea dogs by sailors because they saw them so often. I've got a bunch more info on oceanic white tips by the way guys if you wanted to check that out. We did a creature feature on them back in season four and if you click this link you can give it a watch. Okay so we've got our shark species that were most likely responsible. I'll admit they're could have been others too, but those are the two that stand out the most to me anyway. But the question is, why did they attack? And what were the factors that increased the likelihood of them attacking? So the Indianapolis has gone down and as it's gone down, it's probably made a ton of noise that as it's doing so is sending vibrations through the water, probably for miles and miles. Then you've got about 900 human beings that have been thrust into the water, all kicking, splashing and screaming. It's likely to be a pretty noisy affair all round. Sharks on the other hand are incredible animals and over millions and millions of years of evolution have been perfectly designed to do one thing which is find and eat food. One of the tools that they use to do this is something called the lateral line. And I'll admit it's not just specific to sharks, it's present in all fish. We haven't really spoken much about the lateral line here on Shark Bites, surprisingly, so I'll briefly run you through it. It's essentially a sensory organ that runs down the full length of the body on both sides, all the way from the head to the tip of the tail. They're kind of like a set of tubes and the insides of those tubes are lined with sensory cells that have hair-like protrusions. Water flows into these tubes via pores on the sides of the body and then these sensory cells can detect vibrations in the water as well as pressure changes. So we've just had some pretty big explosions and then a ton of splashing in the water by 900 people, which is likely instantly being picked up from sharks that are in and around the area, some of which are probably miles and miles away. These sharks have then come into an area where there are likely already a lot of dead sailors in the water and as opportunistic predators, may have been feeding on some of the dead bodies. So that's probably initially how a load of sharks ended up in the area, but we don't start getting our first confirmed recorded attacks on some of the living sailors until the very early hours of Tuesday morning. That's around 24 to 30 hours after the ship sank. So why was there a bit of a delay? Well, my thinking is that based on a lot of the survivor accounts, the majority of the men were covered in oil initially. As that ship went down, it spilt fuel and oil into the water. And most of these men were caked head to toe in this stuff to the point where they couldn't even recognize each other. Oil is not a particularly good thing for a shark to be around, but eventually the men started to drift out of these oil slicks and it started to wash off their bodies. So I think that could be part of the reason why we don't see any recorded shark attacks on the men for a little while after the ship went down. It could also be because sharks generally are initially pretty wary and tend to scope out their surroundings before they get a little bit bolder. But I do think the oil played somewhat of a role in this. Some of the men then decided to rip off parts of their clothing around their arms and their legs to use as make 
makeshift bandages for the injured. And in other cases, they were using ripped off sections of their clothing to cover their eyes to protect them from the glaring sun, which was causing some of them to literally go blind. And in doing so, they've started to reveal pale patches of skin on their bodies that are looking pretty shiny in the water. This could be interpreted by a shark as a food item, and I think this is another one of the reasons why these sailors initially started to get bitten. There's an interesting quote here from survivor Harlan Twybel. Here's what he had to say. They would grab them and take them down, and then we would see part of the body pop up. Uh, it appeared to me that they were eating the extremities of the people rather than the whole body. And so you'll note that he says it appeared to him the sharks were biting and eating the extremities of the men and not the whole body. I think this matches up pretty well with the fact that some of these men were ripping off some of their clothing and revealing their extremities, i.e. their arms and their legs, and these were the areas of the body that were getting attacked. I've said before on Shark Bites that when you're trying to stay shark safe in the water, it's really important that you make sure you're nice and covered up and no shiny bits are showing. When you've got your pale skin out, and sadly for me, it is particularly pale, and that is reflecting in the water, you really, really do increase your chances of getting a bite from a shark. Okay, so we've got men in the water now, and a lot of them are broken up into different groups spread across the ocean. Some of which are miles and miles apart. By Tuesday, we start getting a lot more reports of sharks that are circling and bumping into some of the sailors. But going through some of the accounts, there are some groups of men that are having to fend off sharks all the time, and there are some groups of men that haven't even seen any sharks. It's likely that there are hundreds of sharks in and around the surrounding waters at the time, but there are some eyewitness accounts from groups of men that saw one or two sharks in the entire four days that they were in the water. One or two. I thought this was a little bit strange and I was spitballing with myself as to why this might be. As I was reading through the eyewitness accounts, there was something that cropped up very regularly and this was the life rafts. Now, when I say life rafts, these weren't the normal type of life raft that you might imagine a ship would have in the event of a sinking. These were pretty naff life rafts, which basically consisted of a rectangular section of floating devices with some netting hanging below into the water. So even if you were in a life raft, you were basically still in the water and susceptible to a bite from a shark. They really didn't provide much protection at all, and I actually think they might have made the situation a little bit worse, which I'll tell you about in a second. As I said before, at this point, the survivors are spread into different groups some of which have life rafts, some of which don't have any life rafts. One of the groups which didn't have any life rafts was documented by survivor and senior medical officer, Dr. Haynes. He was in a group of about 400 men and he spent the majority of his time tending to the wounded and declaring people dead. So here in his recollections, he states, I only saw one shark. In the entire 110 hours I was in the water, I did not see a man attacked by a shark. So there's a senior medical officer who spent his entire time tending to the wounded and declaring people dead and in the whole time that he was in the water without a life raft he's not seen a man attacked by a shark. 300 of the 400 men in Dr. Haynes's group died he would know because he declared them dead and not a single one of those men that he declared dead was as a result of a shark. So how can it be that in the whole time that this group was in the water with no life rafts that no sharks were witnessed by the doctor attacking people. Well, I think that the rafts may have played a role in actually increasing your chances of getting attacked by a shark on this occasion. Out in the ocean, structures that are floating around are often used by fish species as safe havens, and they tend to aggregate around these structures. Over time, humans even started cottoning onto this, and they developed tools to help them try and catch fish, which are known today as fish aggregating devices. FADs. These FADs would be placed in the water and over time, smaller fish would start aggregating around them, which would then tend to draw in the bigger fish that were predating on the smaller ones. And eventually the entire area around that FAD becomes one big feeding festival. I think it's perhaps possible that the not so well designed life rafts were acting as fish aggregating devices that brought in smaller fish species that lured in larger fish species that eventually lured in the sharks. You then throw in the injured and wounded men who are bleeding in these rafts that are basically underwater and you've got yourself a recipe for a shark attack. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this was the sole reason for these attacks taking place. And it is likely that there were men who didn't have rafts that were still being attacked by sharks. I've not read every single eyewitness account from the USS Indianapolis, so it's entirely possible that there were non-raft groups that were still getting attacked by sharks. But then you look at Dr. Haynes account and out of the 400 men in that group 300 died none of which he attributed to shark attacks and they didn't have a life raft anywhere in that group 
I just think that's pretty interesting. Haynes does note in his recollections that the destroyers that eventually rescued them attempted to retrieve as many bodies as they possibly could from the water. He says that that report suggested 56 bodies that were retrieved from the water had been mutilated, i.e. had been attacked by sharks. So he's not suggesting that no one was attacked by sharks, but perhaps not as many as has been suggested down the years. In total, somewhere between 500 and 600 of the 900 men that entered the water died, leaving only 316. And it's impossible to know exactly how many of those men were killed by sharks. Some historians have estimated it to be somewhere between a dozen and 150, but that's a pretty big range. It's more likely that the bigger killer for those who entered the water from the USS Indianapolis was dehydration and the consumption of salt water as opposed to the sharks. Yes, okay, some of the sharks probably did feed off the bodies of those who had died, but the main culprit was most definitely the elements. And when we think about the shark species that may have been responsible, these are opportunistic shark species who eat what they can to survive and in times of need, will most definitely feed on the remains of dead human beings. I think when this story's been told down the years, everyone immediately jumps to the sharks being the main culprit. We've got Quint's incredible monologue from Jaws, which popularized the story, but it probably meant a lot of people immediately think of the sharks as the main culprit of the USS Indianapolis. And then whenever you read about the USS Indianapolis as well, it's always something along the lines of worst shark attack in history. But when you look at it in a little bit more detail, although undoubtedly, yes, there would have been shark attacks, was there really that many? So there we have it, guys. That's the story of the sharks and the USS Indianapolis from the perspective of a shark scientist. I am super keen to hear all of your thoughts on this one. And I know there's loads of you watching at home that are gonna really, really love this topic. So please let me know what you think in the comments. What sharks do you think were responsible for the attacks and how many shark attacks do you think there actually were? Make sure you comment that below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. It massively helps out the channel every time you click that like button. And if you're not subscribed to Shark Bites yet, make sure you click that big red subscribe button below so you can stay up to date with all of our latest videos in season five. Until then, see you next time.